Welcome to Random Variables. In this video, we're going to talk about some discrete random variable examples. We're going to look at um, three examples where the probability distribution is given to us. Then we're going to look at a fourth example where we actually have to build the probability distribution. But I really want to show you in this video is what these problems look like and what kind of questions could be asked when you are looking at one of these discrete random variable problems. So let's dive right into the first one. The number of tickets purchased by a customer for a musical performance at a certain concert hall could be considered a random variable. The table below shows the relative frequency distribution for the number of tickets purchased by a customer. So let's actually give this random variable a letter. Oftentimes we do assign random variables a letter. So we'll use a T for tickets purchased. And this is discrete because the number of tickets purchased is a whole number and it's listable. It's, it's one, two, three, four, five. If you purchase zero tickets, you're never going to come to the concert in the first place. And they've looked at maybe many, 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 many concerts and no one has ever purchased more than five tickets or, or maybe they actually don't allow it. All right, so the cool thing about this is that the probabilities are given to us. So one thing that could be asked of you are some just really basic probability questions. Like maybe they could ask you, hey, are these events mutually exclusive? And the answer would be, well, let's first remember what mutually exclusive means, right? Mutually exclusive means the two events that cannot happen at the same time. So can you purchase one ticket and three tickets? No, you can either purchase one or you can purchase three. So these events are all mutually exclusive. Now, what about independence? Well, it doesn't directly say it, but I think we could probably go on a limb here and assume that what happens on one purchase is independent of the next. Meaning if the first person purchases three tickets, that doesn't make the next person any more or less likely to purchase three tickets or four or five or one or two, right? Every single purchase of uh, tickets, every single person, every single customer is independent of the next. Okay, so what other kind of questions could we ask you? Well, we could ask you about the shape of this distribution, right? And that's where, you know, you can kind of think about the fact that if you think about histogram, right? Um, one is 20%, two is 45%, so that's pretty high. And then it kind of goes down, three, 10%, four jumps back up a little bit to 20% and then falls off. So I don't know if this would have a really definite shape. So one is at 20%. Two is at 45%, three is at 10%, four is back at 20%, and five is down here at 5%. So it's just kind of like a rough histogram of what this would look like for one, two, three, four, and five tickets purchase. So maybe you could say unimodal, right? Definitely two, per, two tickets purchase is the most frequent. And you could maybe make a case for slightly skewed to the right, because as we move to the higher numbers, three, four, and five, it does go down a little bit. Okay, great. But what other kind of cool questions could we ask you? We could ask you some like probability questions, right? So for example, we could say, what is the probability that the number of tickets purchased equals two? Well, that'd be a really easy question. 45%, 0.45, all I'm going to do is look at the table. What is the probability that the number of tickets is greater than two? Okay, now I got to be really careful because greater than two means more than two. So not two, not one. Those are less than or equal to two. So greater than two would be three, four, five. So we just got to add those together and that'd be a grand total of 35%. 10, 20, and 5. Pretty easy. Um, what is the probability the number of tickets sold is at least 1? At least 1. Well, that means greater than or equal to 1. Well, that's 100%, right? Because there's it's it's the, based on the table, there's going to be either 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. So it's definitely going to be 1 or more. So that could be definitely 100% there. Another easy question. Now, another more slightly more complicated question could be what if you know two customers in a row both purchase three tickets so now we're talking about the first customer purchasing three tickets that's a 10 percent probability and then we need the next customer to also purchase that would be another 10 percent we would just multiply those pretty pretty easy there now this multiplication does have to hinge on the truth that they are independent what this customer does has nothing to do with what this customer does or vice versa so this would of course become a one percent chance that two customers in a row both purchase three tickets pretty easy nothing too complicated there but probability questions are quite simple when you have one of these tables they, they make for pretty easy questions and, and hopefully ones that you can get correct all right here's another one where we see a graph as our probability distribution so when a book editor edits a book sometimes they have to make some major changes so s represents the number of major changes needed when an editor edits a book 
and we see in the table here or in the in the graph we can have zero one two three four five six seven or it looks like there's a slim chance that eight major changes are needed i would definitely describe this as skewed to the right and unimodal we see that, that you know majority of the time books need one or two major changes and we definitely see a slow trickle down to the right but of course what are some questions i could ask you here we could say all right what's the probability that a book needs um let's see here s equaling three a book needs three major changes so we go to three here we just kind of have to cross over and this is where we have to kind of you know use our brains a little bit and kind of make a little bit of a guess and you could even do like 17 and a half percent if you wanted right there'd be nothing wrong with that you, you, you know, that's one of the drawbacks of histogram we've mentioned that before so you gotta do a little bit of um guesstimating so even if you said it's about 18 percent that's probably going to work too and then we could ask a question, what's the probability that a book needs um, less than three? Less than three edits. Now, again, remember, it doesn't say equal to three. It says less than three. So it would be zero, one, or two. So we're just going to add those together. Zero looks to be at about 14%. Again, a little guesstimating there. Uh, one and two both look to be, I don't know, maybe about 23%. So we got two of those. So we got to go ahead here and say we got 46 about 60 total percent so it's just going to add those together so 60 percent chance that a book will need less than three total edits not too bad nice and simple hopefully um other questions we could say if they're independent right that is so big what happens to one book cannot affect the next we say hey what's the probability that the um first book has zero changes and the second book has five changes. So the first book has zero changes. That would be about 14%. And then we need the second book to have five changes. Let's say we estimate that. Again, just kind of eyeballing that, maybe about 3%, and we'd multiply those and we'd get our answer. But again, that is so important that that hinges on independence. That'd be 0 0.0042. So very slim chance that that's going to happen in that exact order. Why would that be so unlikely? Well, because most books need one or two changes. So to get 0 and then 4, or excuse me, 0 and then 5, it should be kind of unlikely to happen twice in a row. All right, here's another example. So based on his past record, Luke and Archer for a college archery team has a probability of 90% of hitting the inner ring of a target with shot of an arrow. So he shoots his arrow. He's got a 90% chance of hitting the inner ring of the target. He's been you know, practicing. He's pretty good. Obviously, all probabilities come with um, something for free. So that means we automatically know there's a 10% chance he does not hit the inner circle. So let's assume that in practice, Luke will attempt five shots of the arrow, and each shot is independent of the next. That's awesome. That means that the probability that he makes or misses doesn't go up or down based on what happens prior. And we're going to let the random variable x be how many times he hits the target in the five attempts. So if he has five attempts, he can either hit the target zero times, one time, two times, three times, four times, five times. That is listable. That has a beginning. That has an end. Those are whole numbers only. This is a great example of a discrete random variable. And here we have those probabilities. So because he's really, really good, he actually has the highest chance of him making all five targets. I mean, come on. He's a 90% shooter, so he should make all five in a row. But hitting four in a row is also pretty likely. And then 3, 2, 1, and 0, kind of less likely because that would mean he misses a lot, but statistically, he doesn't miss a lot. He's a 90% archer. So another thing we could ask you is, you know, what's the shape? And this would be skewed to the left. And again, if we just kind of think about a histogram, really, really low on the far left, and then it slowly gets higher and higher. So it looks something like this, low, 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 and then it gets really, really high on the far right, which is, again, skewed to the left. And then we could ask the classic question, say, what's the probability he makes at least one, right? So we want uh, the number of shots he makes to be greater than or equal to one, at least one. Now, there's actually two ways you can answer this question. We could just know that at least one means one or more. So we could add together one, two, three, four, five, and then we get our answer. But the opposite of at least one is none. So we could do one minus the probability that he makes zero shots zero targets. So if we just take um, 100% and get rid of making none, then we're going to get our answer pretty quickly as well. So if we do 1 minus 0 0.00001, and that's pretty easy, easy math to do, not too difficult, but that's going to give us a really good chance, 0 0.9. 
99.9999, almost a 99.99% chance that he's going to make at least one shot. Well, that's because he's really, really good at shooting that bullseye. So a nice example there with some pretty simple questions. All right, but here's the cool thing. Sometimes a probability distribution where you are listing all of the options, all of the outcomes, and all the probabilities is not given to you. You have to build it. And these present kind of fun questions, I think, that you're going to have to tackle. So here's a really good one I came up with. At a carnival is a game where a player must throw a baseball to hit a bottle and knock it over. Classic game, throw a baseball, knock a bottle over. Doug estimates that he has a 60% chance of knocking the bottle over on any given throw. On any given throw means that it should be independent. What happens on one throw, not going to be affected by the next. Now, here's the couple extra details. The game costs $3 to play, and Doug only has $15 to spend. Once he wins the game or runs out of money, he is done. Let B represent the number of baseballs he throws and create a probability distribution for B. So here we go. So B is the number of baseballs he throws. So we're going to have to think about all the different possibilities there and then calculate the probabilities. Now, can he throw zero baseballs? Well, I mean, he's playing the game, so he's at least going to throw one. If he throws zero, he's not even playing the game. It clearly says he wants to play this game. So we're going to start off with one baseball. Now, what would have to happen for him to throw one baseball and be done? Well, that means he throws one baseball, he hits the bottle, falls over, he wins the prize. That is 60%. Easy. All right, what's the probability he throws two baseballs? Well, to throw two baseballs means that on the first throw, he lost. And which is why he says, all right, I guess I'm going to play again. And then on the second throw, he wins. Because if he throws two baseballs, he has to win. Because remember, he's going to throw until he either wins the game or he runs out of money. So if he's throwing two baseballs, he misses on the first, hits it on the second, and he's now won the game, hence he's done. So now i got to walk through that. He needs to miss the first. Well, if there's a 60% chance he makes, there's a 40% chance he misses, times 60% make on that second throw. So multiply that together, 0.4 times 0.6 is 0.24. Sorry for my messy handwriting there. All right, now what about three? What about three baseballs? Well, let's see here. That's going to be um, a miss on the first, 0 0.40. A miss on the second, 0 0.40. And then a make on the third. And when he makes it on the third, he is now done with the game. He won. He's happy. He's over. He's going to stop when he wins or he runs out of money. So let's see here. That's 0 0.4 times 0 0.4 times 0 0.6. 0.096. Okay, four baseballs. Now we got to start talking about money. Remember, every time he throws, it does cost $3. So for one baseball, $3, he wins. Two baseballs, $6, he wins. Three baseballs, $9, he wins. Okay, number he has $15. And that's when he's going to have to say, listen, I can't spend more than that. That's all I have in my pocket. But let's keep going because four baseballs would be $12 plenty of money in his pocket for that. So what would four baseballs look like? Well, that would be a miss, a miss, a miss, and then finally on that fourth throw, he makes it. Yay, he's happy. So 0.4, and you can actually use exponents if you want to speed this up, 0.4 raised to the third times 0.6, and that would be 0.0384. Okay, now what about five baseballs? Well, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, so please pay attention. All right, so five baseballs. Well, one thing that could happen is he misses four straight times, 0 0.40 to the fourth. So he misses on the first, misses on the second, misses on the third, misses on the fourth. But he finally hits it on the fifth, and he wins. So 0.4 raised to the fourth times 0.6, and we get 0.01536. Now, some people would stop right there, but don't stop yet. There is another option for throwing five baseballs. He could miss all of them. Five times $3 is $15. So, another option where he throws five baseballs, and that's it, is he misses on all of them. He never wins, 0.4 to the fifth. This is another option, but this option also results in five throws. So he can either throw f the five baseballs, winning on the fifth baseball, and he's happy. Okay, great. Or he could throw five baseballs, miss all five of them, but he doesn't have enough money to play anymore, so that's why he is also over. So we have to include this as well. So 0.4 raised to the fifth is 0.0124. 
So now we got to add these remaining ones together. So we're going to add 0 0.01536 and 0 0.0. 0 0.10, I forgot a zero in here, I'm so sorry. There should be a zero right in between that two and four, or between the one and the two, point one point zero one zero two four. apologize for that. And we get 0 0.0256 is our grand total here. And nice thing you can do is add all these together to make sure that they add up to one. So throws a baseball, win, 60% chance, done, out the door. Two baseballs, first one's a miss, second one's a win. Three baseballs, two misses, then a win. Four baseballs, four, uh, excuse me, three misses, and then a win. Five baseballs, and here's where we got to really put on a thinking cap. That could be four misses followed by a win, or all five miss, which means he's out of money, so he's done with the game. So there's two options to throwing five baseballs. And since there's two options, we have to add those two options together to get the final probability for that outcome. Okay, pretty cool, pretty simple, but that's a pretty cool problem too as well. And then of course, after you have made this table, we can ask you some more questions like, hey, what's the probability he throws four or more baseballs? Well, in that case, we have to add the probabilities for four and five together to get that answer. We could ask you, hey, what's the probability he throws three or less baseballs? So we'd add the probabilities for three, two, and one, get that final answer as well. Those questions are pretty simple, but the hard part is building this table and you just got to think you just have to think. Now, I want to say one more thing about this problem that's super important is if it didn't say that the the throws were independent, meaning that, you know, it said right there, he has 6% chance of knocking the bottle over on any given throw. If it didn't say that, the problem would actually be impossible. We would not have enough information to do it. If he was getting worse or getting better with subsequent throws, then the probabilities would be changing and we wouldn't know how to do it. So it's staying 60% on every single throw, no matter what happened before, is actually super important to us being able to solve this problem. All right. Hope you have a little bit better understanding of discrete random variables and you saw a couple of examples where the distribution is given to you and you're asked some questions and here's a problem where you have to build the probability distribution and these tend to be pretty cool problems and, and not too bad as well. All right, take care. Hope you like discrete random variables.